Welcome to Sino Warfare with Ralph D. Sawyer. Whether for farmland, water, or to escape threats, splinter groups and entire villages sometimes migrated, especially in the Neolithic period and the first two dynasties when the population was low and the land was vacant. However, even then the most desirable terrain, usually along rivers or next to lakes and mountain streams, was often inhabited, restricting their slice selection or compelling them to forcefully displace the inhabitants. Shortages of materials, particularly soil with suitable characteristics, could also adversely affect the siting, as might overly easy or difficult access due to the implications for daily life and for defense. They might also fatally compromise the tactical integrity of the defensive structures. Now, whether seeking protection or simply wanting to define themselves as a community, groups intent on fortifying their villages can be divided into two categories, established villages and migrating groups seeking to occupy a new site, including those dispatched to project political power and extend authority, as at the Joe's inception. Even though a village's boundaries might be nebulous, the inhabitants in pre-existing settlements always had a sense of where their defensive lines needed to fall. In contrast, migrant groups normally sought to impose preconceived shapes on the terrain. However, whether walls for cities, lines for defense, or bastions for troops, immutable geographic features, such as mountains, lakes, and rivers, as well as significant undulations, major irregularities, including crevices, caves, outcroppings, compelled builders to abandon any hope of realizing idealized geometrical shapes. But on the other hand, long before Swinza's extensive analysis of configurations of terrain, defense-minded thinkers had already recognized their significance and begun taking advantage of them. But in an age of primitive tools and hand labor, not every opportunity could be exploited, nor every obstacle overcome. The walls therefore had to be reconfigured, resulting in trapezoids, trushed corners, odd indentations, elongations, just as uh, exemplified by the layout of Chengzi Yai, a mid-third millennium BC settlement. As the population increased and the economy prospered, urban walls naturally evolved in design and in extensiveness. Now, as previously mentioned, the major shift was from simple ditches, with or without the production of stockades or barrier mounds, to systematically engineered and laboriously pounded walls with conjoined ditches or moats. Thereafter, seemingly on the principle that if one is good, two are better but actually to encompass more of the ordinary populace rather than just the elite and privileged, cities with double walls gradually appeared, again with or without integrated boats, as shown in this encyclopedic depiction. Eventually, as we will shortly see, some cities added a third concentric structure. Nevertheless, significant numbers of the always compelled to dwell outside. With the addition of inner citadels or royal quarters demarked by internal walls, the final form of the Chinese capital, one theoretically distinguished by an inner and outer wall rather than the thickness of the fortifications or the integrity of the moat encircling defensive compound was realized. Gate openings, the weakest point in any defensive effort, also multiplied. Now, while they weren't arbitrarily limited to just one or two, and they could be positioned to exploit localized tactical advantage, they rarely exceeded four per side, and were equally spaced when not centered. Overall, from the spring and autumn period onward, city walls tend to become narrower and higher, and moats gradually lose their importance, even disappear. Nevertheless, across the millennia, Variations in tactical situation, manpower, and materials would always prove more important than general trends. Strategic intent also differed. For example, 
The smaller towns on a state's border might be much more heavily fortified than those on the interior, even the capital itself, in order to blunt the onslaught of invading forces, particularly in the late spring and autumn and warring space periods when the realm was fragmented. Although it's therefore difficult to definitively characterize their evolution, let's take a look at the simplified outlines of a few key cities. Whether consisting of ditches alone, walls alone, or walls with ditches, the earliest fortified towns were generally circular rather than square or rectangular. In heavily watered areas, the ditches naturally became moats, but in drier locations, moats were later and thus a deliberate development. Several culturally defining sites achieved their final form by about 3000 BC. Chengtoshan, which is located in Henan, and thus south of the Yellow River, probably reaches back to about 3800 BC. It typifies the wall and moat town. The present remnants, which probably date to about 2800 BC, form a nearly perfect circle with a, a diameter that varies from 315 to 325 meters. The walls still have a height of 3 to 5 meters or about 10 to 16 feet. The moat ranges from 35 to 50 meters in width and has an average depth of about 4 meters or 13 feet. The walls themselves consist of mounded earth, but the moat is partially excavated and partially takes advantage of a natural depression. The wall and moat remnants at uh, Shijiahe and Hubei date to about 2600 BC. They form a somewhat distorted circle, as we can see here. The overall dimensions are about 1200 meters from north to south and 1100 from east to west. The walls run about 8 to 10 meters in width and had an average height of 6 meters to 8 meters, or nearly 20 to 27 feet. The astonishingly expansive moat, which is roughly 80 to 100 meters in width, or more than a football field, tapers in one portion to about 60 meters. Multiplicity being good, another layer of ditches, or moats, and of walls for a total of six defensive obstacles, appeared late warring states periods and then in imperial times though usually only at capitals, in which the innermost sector was the preserve of the royalty. Moats are actually seen less and less over time, though the penultimate expression is the fully integrated three-wall, three-moat realization at Yencheng. It was probably built by the state of Wu in the last decade of the 6th century BC, not long before the state's extinction. It's a unique site in having only water gates. The 500 meter long innermost wall at the Yencheng is about 10 meters wide at the top, 3 to 5 meters high. It's fully surrounded by an 800 meter long moat that ranges from 30 to 40 meters in width and has a depth that exceeds 4 meters. In the next concentric wall later, which is uh, somewhat higher at an astonishing 11 to 15 meters, or roughly 50 feet maximum, the moat is also somewhat wider, 50 to 70 meters, and has a depth of 4 to 5 meters, or 13 to 17 feet. Finally, the outer ring, which is defined by a 2,500 meter long wall, has a slightly greater width of 20 meters, and a more moderate height of 9 to 13. The moat is generally between 50 and 50, 60 meters wide, but sometimes reaches 80. Analysts estimate the moat alone would have required 400,000 workdays, which seems a bit high. Now, as previously mentioned, the second important development was realizing that pounding the earth not only improves durability, it provides the structural integrity needed for higher, and therefore comparatively thinner, walls. By the time of the immensely important Shang capital of Bo at Yenshi, which was completed around 1800 BC, the Hangtu, pounded earth, method of construction had become common. It would remain the preferred method until the Northern Dynasties and the Tang, and of course the Great Wall, which employed stone faces. However, local variants might be built solely out of stone, or occasionally brick. Yen Shur's somewhat rectangular shape marks a departure from the earlier, simply concentric wall and moat design. Moreover, the lower inner quarter, demarked by a thinner but still functional wall of 2 to 3 meters wide, 
delimited a sort of royal city. The outer walls, which range in width from about 16 to 24 meters, were fully surrounded by a protective moat. Overall, the rectangular dimensions are about 1,300 by 1,800 meters. Panlongchang in Hubei is another well-known Shang city. It more fully realizes the rectangular shape. It may have been constructed around 1400 BC to control the sourcing and transportation of vital metal ore. Despite being located on a lakeside peninsula, it still had a moat, but was quite compact, being only 290 meters north to south and about 260 east to west. Nevertheless, the walls still run from 20 to 45 meters wide. Even though geomantic considerations began to play a role in the Warring States period, cities continued to be oriented north to south, with well-defined streets that ran east to west and north to south. They were also increasingly divided into sectors by extensive interior walls that could impede criminals and aggressors alike. As towns and cities grew in population, they were redesigned, sometimes extensively, and expanded, either by adding another wall further out on the perimeter to include more of the burgeoning population and important craft production facilities, or one abutting an existing structure. To acquire buildable and habitable space, moats were sometimes filled, especially those on the interior. Shortly after its founding in 1145 BC, the Zhou established a secondary capital at Luoyang called Chengzhou in order to better control the eastern portion of the realm. When the Western Zhou then collapsed and the government was forced to flee east by barbarian pressure in 771 BC, as seen here, it was expanded northward in order to serve the now displaced government. Once Qin annihilated the last remnants of the Zhou state, it further expanded the fortifications to the south. This shows how cities in China, just like Rome and London, Paris, uh, once established, continue to be modified and used. The capital of the prominent heritage Spring and Autumn state of Lu, itself established right at the founding of the Zhou, looked like this around 500 BC, at the end of the Spring and Autumn period. Though the walls are only about 10 meters wide at the top, they're fully surrounded by a moat. Rough dimensions for the site are approximately 3,700 meters east to west and 2,500 meters north to south, or about two miles by one and a half. About a fifth of the site was set aside for the royal quarters, which were demarked by internal walls and located in the southwest corner. The almost perfectly rectangular site of Pingyang, whose overall dimensions are shown on the diagram, was built in the spring and autumn period and continued to be used well into the Warring States era. The walls averaged about 6 to 9 meters in height, or 20 to 30 feet, and they had a width of 20 to 30 meters at the top, or 65 to 95 feet. This would allow deployment of a very large defensive force. About 300 BC, the secondary capital of the northern state of Yen, one of the first to erect a long wall to fend off barbarian challenges, looked like this after an essentially self-contained western portion was added to the original eastern section. Including the protrusion, the northern wall extends about 10,000 meters, or slightly more than six miles. While not shown here, evidence of a protective moat has also been discovered. Being located in the strategically advantageous Wei River Valley, the site which is now known as Xi'an, and also the place where both the Zhou and the Qin dynasty arose, has played a critical role throughout Chinese history. After serving as the Qin capital known as Shenyang, it remained a crucial administrative center even when it was relegated to a secondary role because of the difficulty of administering the realm from an extreme, somewhat isolated western location. It was repeatedly redesigned and transformed in the Han and subsequent dynasties, and it was called Chang'an. This is the probable reconstruction of the shape in the former or western Han dynasty. By the Tang, Chang'an had evolved to look like this. About the same time, the former eastern Zhou capital and still important city of Luoyang looked like this. The Lo River flows between the two sections.
As always, thank you for watching.